Saul is still out in the wilderness of Ziph hunting David down. And the men of Ziph are helping him, feeding him information whenever David moves to a new camp. And David, of course, is gathering his own intelligence about Saul's movements. And one night he stumbles upon Saul's camp. David and his nephew Abishai sneak down to have a closer look. And there in the middle of the sleeping troops, they see Saul and his cousin Abner, who is commander of Saul's armies. Saul's spear is thrust into the ground near his head where he can grab it quickly in case of attack. Abishai whispers to David, look, God has delivered Saul into your hands. Let me pin him to the ground with my spear. But David says, no, no, don't do violence to him for he's the Lord's anointed. His day Amen. will come. Either the Lord will smite him or he will die a natural death or he will fall in battle, but he will not die by my hand. Let's he's just take the spear and the water jug by his head and leave. And none of the troops awaken because the Lord has covered them with a deep sleep. Once they're well away, David stands on a mountainside and calls down, Abner, Abner. And Abner, awaking, says, who is that who's calling out to the king? And David says, one of the troops came down to do violence to the king, and you did not guard him. You all deserve death. See, here is the king's spear and water jug. Saul, who is fully awake by now, says, is that you, David? And David replies, it is my king. Why are you chasing me? What evil have I ever done to you? If the Lord says I've done evil to you, let me atone for it with an offering. And if men are saying I've done evil to you, they are lying. I'm a mere flea. Why are you wasting your time on me? And Saul says, I am the one who has done wrong, my son. Come back. I will not harm you. For I can see that you have counted my life precious in your sight this very day. But David says, send a lad over here to get your spear. And Saul says, as you wish, David, you're blessed. And you, David, will surely prevail. And David goes on his way while Saul returns home. David knows that Saul is of two minds. So he resolves to flee to the country of the Philistines and hide there. Saul will never pursue him there. So David and his wives Ahinoam and Abigail and his 600 men and their households all flee to Gath, the Philistine city ruled by Achish. Yes, the very same ruler that David escaped from earlier by pretending to be mad. But David is not alone this time. With 600 fighting men backing him up, he's able to demand that Akish give him the town of Ziklag in the far south region. David phrases it as a request with typical Eastern politeness, but it's a hammer wrapped in a velvet. It's a request Akish cannot refuse. David and his men use Ziklag as their base for making enemy raids for over a year. And the whole time he tells Akish that he's raiding the tribes of Judah while he's actually raiding the enemies of Judah, people like the Amalekites and people who are potential allies of the Philistines. David makes sure to leave no one alive in his raids so that word will not get back to Akish that he's double crossing him. Of course, eventually Akish prepares to go to war against Israel himself and he insists that David enter into the battle on the side of the Philistines. Well, David knows he could never make war against Israel. He's caught between a rock and a hard place. So he says, uh, certainly when you go into battle, you know what I will do. Now, that's kind of a tricky answer, isn't it? And Akish says, and as a result, you will become my bodyguard for life. Hmm, a tricky reply. Will this be a punishment or a reward for David? It's sort of like the saying, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. And so the Philistines gather for war against Israel. The Philistines camp at Shunem, while Saul and his, and his forces camp at Gilboa. 
Up to now, most of the action has been down south, west of the Dead Sea, where the Philistines' main territory is. But notice that we're way up north now, near the Sea of Galilee. Notice that the forces are amassing at the edge of the Jezreel Valley, a big plain that seems to be tailor-made for large-scale battles. We've already seen some battles there. When Saul sees the size of the Philistine army, he trembles in fear and decides to ask uh, whether the Lord will defend Israel or not. He calls on the priests and the prophets, but no one is able to get an answer from the Lord for him. Even the Urim and Thummim are silent. Saul becomes frantic and sends his servants to search for a medium, sometimes called a necromancer or a witch. It's someone who speaks to the dead. Someone for him to consult, even though in accordance with God's law, he's previously outlawed all such people who try to speak to the dead. But since the Lord won't answer him, Saul is going to take matters into his own hands. His servants tell him there is a witch nearby at Endor. So Saul disguises himself and takes two of his men with him. And when night falls, they seek out the witch of Endor. Saul says, I want you to call up a ghost for me. But the woman says, you know that's against the law. Saul will put me to death if he discovers I'm calling forth the spirits of the dead. But Saul, still in disguise, swears in the name of the Lord, no less, that no harm will come to her. So the woman says, who then shall I call up? And Saul says, Samuel. Oh my, this is not good. The woman does indeed call up Samuel. But when she sees him, she screams, for her eyes are opened and she realizes she's in the presence of King Saul himself. But Saul says, do not fear. Tell me what you see. And the woman says, I see a God rising up from the earth. And Saul says, what does he look like? And she says, he's an old man wrapped in a cloak. And Saul knows she has indeed called Samuel forth. And Saul falls to the ground. Samuel says, why have you disturbed me? And Saul says, I am in terrible trouble, Samuel. The Philistines have arisen against me and the Lord has deserted me entirely. He will not answer me through prophets or even dreams. And I must know, I have called you so you can tell me what to do. And Samuel says, why do you ask me when the Lord himself has turned away from you? He has done as he promised. He has torn the kingship away from you and given it to David. You did not obey the Lord. Neither did you destroy the Amalekites when he told you to. Tomorrow, you and all of Israel will fall at the hands of the Philistines. It will be the Lord's doing and you and your sons will all die. At this, Saul flings himself full length on the ground beside himself with fear and fatigue for he's neither eaten nor drunk anything all day long. Samuel departs and the witch of Endor coaxes Saul to get up and eat something so he can go on his way. What a disaster. The Philistines continue to amass their armies during the night while the armies of Israel gather at Jezreel. Now remember, David and his men are bringing up the rear guard at the back of the Philistine army. But the Philistine captains are kind of nervous about having David and his men behind them. And at the last second, they make Achish send David away. And thus the Lord intervenes to save David from an impossible situation. So David and his men tromp back down south to Ziklag, only to find that while they were gone, the Amalekites attacked and burned the city to the ground and took all their women and children captive, including David's own wives, Ahinoam and Abigail. David's troops are distraught and pick up stones to kill David for letting their wives and children be taken captive. David does not fight them, but instead turns to the Lord for help. 
He calls Abiathar the, the priest forward and asks him to bring out the ephod. And David asks, Lord, shall I pursue the Amalekite raiding party? So I wanna point out here that the ephod is that breastplate the priest is wearing. It's sewn like a big pocket and the Urim and Thummim go inside it. But if King Saul's priest has the Urim and Thummim, what is David's priest using? We don't know. Maybe there's more than one set of Urim and Thummim, but he's got something in his ephod that is functioning like the Urim and Thummim do to give yes, no answers to questions asked of the Lord. The Lord says, yes, pursue the Amalekites, overtake them. You will surely rescue your people. Unfortunately, David has to leave 200 of his men behind for they are too exhausted from the trip north and back to fight. But he takes the remaining 400 with him and they begin tracking the Amalekite raiding party. They come across an Egyptian man who has fainted of thirst, hunger, and exhaustion. They revive him and pump him for information. The man tells them he's, a, he's the slave of an Amalekite, but his master abandoned him when he fell ill three days ago. He agrees to lead David to the raiding party if David promises not to kill him. And sure enough, the man is able to lead them to the Amalekites. David and his men attack them fiercely, fighting from dawn until dark. And David and his men prevail rescuing all the women and children and taking back loads of booty. But when they returned to where they'd left the 200 exhausted men, troublemakers among the 400 fighting men say, why should we give them any booty? They didn't fight, just give them their women and children back. But David says, no, my brothers, the booty we have has been given to us by the Lord. It's by the Lord's hand that we prevailed, not ours. The share of these men must be the same as your shares. And after that, David sends shares of the booty to the elders of Judah, to his friends, and to all the people in Israel who have helped shelter him from Saul. So meanwhile, way up north, day has dawned over Saul and the Philistines, and the battle is engaged. The fighting is fierce. And as the day wanes, the Philistines press hard upon the Israelites. The Israelites fall back to Mount Gilboa and thousands of men are slain. The Philistines, sensing the tide turning, press hard after Saul and his sons. They kill his three sons, including David's beloved Jonathan. Finally, the Philistine archers come within range of Saul. In a hail of arrows, they strike Saul, and unbeknownst to them, they wound him mortally. Wounded and weak, Saul quakes with fear. He begs his armor bearer to draw his sword and run him through so he will not be captured and tortured by the Philistines. But the armor bearer is too frightened to do any such thing. So Saul grabs the sword himself and falls on it. The armor bearer, seeing what Saul has done, falls on his own sword and dies with him. The next day, as the Philistines strip the slain, they find Saul and his three sons dead on Mount Gilboa, and they cut off Saul's head and strip him of his armor and send it throughout Philistine country to bring tidings of their great victory. We're to a part of the Bible where multiple books begin to overlap. Saul's death is at the very end of 1 Samuel, and the story of David continues in 2 Samuel. But Saul's death and the story of David is also found in the book of 1 Chronicles. From here on out, the books of 2 Samuel and Chronicles will run parallel and will draw from both sets of books as we follow the storyline. As you would probably guess by now, the author of Samuel and the chronicler tell the story somewhat differently. For example, the book of Samuel says the Philistines put Saul's armor in the temple of the female idol Ashtaroth and they impale his body at Beit Shean. While the chronicler says they hang his head in the temple of their male god Dagon. But even beyond the details, the perspectives of the books are different. The first nine chapters of Chronicles are listing after listing of genealogies. 
Chapter nine is particularly interesting because it lists the genealogies of the people who eventually return to Jerusalem after the nation is conquered by the Babylonians. It's like three or 400 years after the time of David. So that number one gives us an idea of when the chronicler is writing, but it also gives us a hint as to the chronicler's perspective on the stories. Take a look at the first verse of chapter nine in Chronicles. The chronicler states flatly, they were taken captive to Babylon because of their unfaithfulness. He, he's talking about Israel, and, and that is a true statement. We'll see that their downfall will be a direct result of choosing themselves and other gods rather than trusting Yahweh. But this statement serves to alert us that in editing his stories, the chronicler will emphasize the unfaithfulness of the people and their kings. This is kind of his topic sentence here for his whole book. To the chronicler, this history is to be a cautionary tale aimed at preventing such a calamity from ever befalling the nation again. The stories will be framed to show the cause and effect of the choices the nation will make. And sure enough, when we compare the story of Saul's death at the very end of 1 Samuel to the story of his death in Chronicles, 1 Chronicles chapter 10, we see one significant difference. The chronicler adds, Saul died because he was unfaithful to the Lord. He did not keep the word of the Lord and even consulted a medium for guidance and did not inquire of the Lord. So the Lord put him to death and turned the kingdom over to David, son of Jesse. Now that's all true, except for one statement, right? Saul did inquire of the Lord before he went to the witch of Endor, didn't he? He simply didn't accept the Lord's silence as a response. What the chronicler is pointing out here isn't that one incident, but a larger pattern in Saul's life of taking matters into his own hands rather than waiting on the Lord. When the men of Jabesh Gilead hear what the Philistines have done to Saul, they resolve to rescue his body, for Saul had rescued them from having their eyes gouged out by Nakash the snake, remember? Their warriors travel all night long and take Saul's corpse and the corpses of his sons down from the wall of Beit Shean and bring them back to Jabesh Gilead, where they burn them and bury their bones in honor. David, of course, is way down south and has been busy dealing with the burning of Ziklag and the rescue of his people and his family. So he doesn't hear the news of Saul's death until three days later. The news is brought by an Amalekite of all people. And David says, how do you know Saul and Jonathan are dead? Now, at this point, the man makes a grave mistake. He thinks since Saul is David's enemy, that David will be very pleased with Saul's death. So he makes up a completely fabricated story designed to make himself the hero in Saul's death so David will reward him. He tells David, oh, I myself just happened to be on Mount Gilboa and saw Saul leaning on his spear with the chariots and horsemen of the Philistines pressing near around him. Saul called to me and said, here, I am wounded. I pray you finish me off. And I saw he was already mortally wounded. So I finished him off and I took his crown and the band that was on his arm and see, I have brought them here to you. And he shows David the booty he has looted from Saul's body. Seeing this proof of Saul's death, David tears his garments, as do all the men who are with him. They keen and weep and fast for Saul and for Jonathan and for all of the fallen house of Israel. And David says to the man, why were you not afraid to lift your hand against the Lord's anointed your blood is on your own head, for you yourself bear witness to your crime. And at David's command, the man is executed. After that, David writes a psalm as a lament for Saul and for Jonathan. He says it is to teach the sons of Judah about hard things. The psalm is also recorded in the book of Jashar, which we no longer have. Here are a few excerpts. 
A gazelle lies slain on your heights, Israel. How the mighty have fallen. Saul and Jonathan, in life they were loved and admired, and in death they were not parted. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. How the mighty have fallen. I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. You were very dear to me. Your love for me was wonderful, more wonderful than that of women. How the mighty have fallen. After this, David moves from Ziklag, which is burnt, of course, to Hebron, and there he settles. It's around this time that the men of Judah officially anoint David as their king, and it is here that David is told of the bravery of the men of Jabesh Gilead, and he blesses them for their kindness to Saul. He sends them a share of his booty and says, may your hands be strengthened and may you be men of valor, for your Lord Saul is dead and it is I who is anointed king over the house of Judah. Meanwhile, Saul's cousin Abner, the commander of Saul's army, is scrambling. Jonathan, who should have been in line for the throne, was killed when Saul was. So Abner crowns another one of Saul's sons king. He's 40 years old, and his name, according to the chronicler, is Ishbaal, meaning man of Baal. You'll remember that Baal is the main Canaanite idol. So the chronicler in his cautionary version of this story is highlighting that Saul's son is named after an idol. But the author of the book of Samuel is not writing a cautionary tale. He's apparently worried that having a son by this name makes Saul look like an idol worshiper. So in his version of the story in 2 Samuel, the author changes the name to Ishbosheth, which means man of shame. I'm pointing this out because the authors or schools of authors who wrote these books of the Bible all have their own agendas. This is one of many places where we'll be able to see their petticoats showing. We can see how they alter the text to suit their objectives as they copy from other sources or from each other. And this monkeying around with the words continues even to the modern day. There are Bible translations even nowadays that have clear agendas. In my opinion, the New Living Translation is an example of that, and I rarely use it. But even in other translations, you'll find individual passages that are skewed based on the words selected. So watch for that. Always, always listen to the Holy Spirit if you run across a verse that seems counter to what you know of God. You now have the tools you need in your backpack to check the original language and the context yourself. Don't forget that if you forget how to do it, that I have a page dedicated to free Bible study tools um, out on my website at eversbibleclass.com. So back to the story. Crowning Ishbosheth king sets up a confrontation. Is Ishbosheth king or is David king? At this point, David is only king over the tribe of Judah, but he's expanding his rule quickly. There's going to have to be a reckoning. The two sides meet at Gibeon by a pool of water. Abner and Saul's men are on one side of the pool, while Joab, who is David's nephew and captain of David's army, is arrayed, arrayed with his troops on the other side of the pool. Abner proposes to Joab, let the gladiators fight for us. Joab agrees to this. So 12 warriors from each side fight in fierce hand-to-hand -hand combat. And Joab's warriors, the men of David, are victorious and defeat Abner's warriors. Joab's troops pursue Abner and his troops. Now, two of Joab's brothers are also there that day. Like Joab, they are David's nephews. One of them, Asahel, is a very fast runner and he personally chases Abner. Now, Abner is armed, but Asahel is not. So as he runs, Abner yells over his shoulder to Asahel, turn aside, grab some armor so we can fight each other. I don't want to fight you if you are unarmed, for how will I ever show my face to your brother Joab again? How tragic civil war is. 
Abner is the captain of Ishbosheth's army, while Joab is the captain of David's army, and yet they all know each other. These are men who have trained together and served in Saul's court together. Abner knows and loves Joab and his family. He doesn't want to kill Joab's brother Asahel, even though they're on opposite sides now. Asahel refused to turn aside and grab armor and a sword. He gains on Abner, and in desperation, Abner thrusts the butt of his spear out behind him and impales Asahel on it. Asahel dies instantly. Joab and his remaining brother Abishai and the rest of the troops chase Abner all the rest of the day. Finally, as the sun sets, Abner and his men make a final stand on top of the hill of Ammah. Abner calls out to Joab, must brother kill brother? Tell your men to stop pursuing us. And Joab replies, you are right. If only you had called this out this morning, I could have stopped the pursuit instantly and all this bloodshed could have been avoided. So Joab sounds a ram's horn and calls all his troops to stop the pursuit. He allows Abner and his men to depart in peace while Joab himself returns to the spot where his brother Asahel fell. He and his men gather Asahel's body and take him to Bethlehem where they bury him. And then they travel on, arriving in Hebron as day breaks. Over the next couple of years, fighting continues, but gradually the tide turns and it becomes clear that Israel is consolidating under David. More and more troops and more and more tribes gather around David. You can read some of the exploits in 1 Chronicles chapters 11 and 12. David's warriors become famous. The three, the 30, David's mighty men, they're all legends in their own time. Saul's reign is over and David's is beginning. How very differently these two men view themselves and their relationship to both God and to the people of Israel. We'll do some thinking around this today in our breakout groups. I, uh, I don't know if y'all want to um, do this <clears throat> kind of all at once and random in terms of what you talked about, or if you want to go kind of question by question, I'm good either way. I blend. But I'll, I'll start us off on the first question, but feel free to jump around. And if you didn't talk about these questions the whole time, feel free to jump in with whatever you did end up talking about. Because <laughs> I, I always see these questions as a starting point, not an ending point. So the, the questions were all around, what in the world does it mean to be a person after God's own heart? And I thought, that uh, comparing Saul and David might be really helpful in teasing some of that meaning out. So the first question had to do with how Saul reacted to perceived threats. So mm -hmm. Saul um, uh, perceived David as a threat when the people would sing, you know, Saul has killed his thousands, David his tens of thousands. Mm -hmm. And um, then the David, on the other hand, perceived Saul as a threat, but his reaction was completely different. It was like, you know, why are you wasting your time on me? I'm, I'm not actually a threat to you, Saul. And, and even when Saul was in his power, like we've seen a couple of times now, right? David could have killed him and absolutely refused to. So what did y'all come up with in terms of contrasting those how these two men responded to threat. Um, Paul was somewhat, Saul was somewhat uh, narcissistic. Yeah. Um, you know, he uh, obviously had a problem following directions <laughs> uh, with, with some of the narcissists getting in the way. I guess I, and one thing I wonder is, you know, we've been talking about him having mental illness mm -hmm. and I guess it playing a part in this. Um, so it, it's, it's hard, you know, yes, yeah, Saul, Saul should have definitely followed God's commands. There's no doubt about that. But also part of this uh, contrast between Saul and David 
if if Saul truly had mental illness, then that played a part. Yes, and I think you're you're hitting on something very important to bring out, and that is that this should not be us sitting in judgment of Saul. Mm -hmm. Um, it, there, it is not our place to judge people. And therefore, you know, whatever it is, be it hidden or visible that is going on with them is between them and God. So the, the purpose of, of what we're doing here is to focus on who we need to be, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, and not um, judge other folks. So that's a great point, Ross. One well, thing the that verses you read today said something about Saul being of two minds. Mm. I found that interesting. Yes, he definitely he was schizophrenic. Also, <laughs> <laughs> well, he he definitely was bipolar in some sort. You know, he had he, he definitely would swing between you know throwing spheres and and being depressed. You know, to the point of 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 you know bitter remorse. Yeah. Pat, I saw you say something a second. Yeah, I, one thing that we talked about in our group, Gail, was the fact that, uh, you know, when you compare Saul to David, David recognized the difference between Saul, the leader, and Saul, the anointed one. And when he had those two or three opportunities to kill Saul, he would not for the simple fact that he did not want to kill God's anointed. Even though the man himself, the leader man, was about to kill him, and he knew for a fact that if he got in the right place, he'd be shot and you know, he'd be hit with a spear, you know, with the fact that God's preemptive measures would keep him, you know, as a king down the road. But David really appreciated the difference between the anointing of a man and the, and the faults of a man. And I think that's why he was able to carry the anointing so well on his own, because he had such a deep regard for what it is and what it, what it, how it carries a person when it's being used right when it's being walked in correctly and yeah david clearly had his issues i mean we know that for a fact um, we're gonna run into some of those pretty quick here no but but his response even to nathan when nathan called him out after Bathsheba, his response was so different than what Saul's was when he was you know caught in in uh his various sin like for example with samuel at, at the uh, amalek and i think it's first samuel 15 where he says you know you're you know, i saved all the best for your god to sacrifice to your God, you know. Yeah, so where, where you, it, it sounds so manipulative, right? Yes, yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so since you brought up the Amalekites, um, when Saul battled the Amalekites, the Lord told him to take no prisoners, no booty, but he took their king prisoner anyway and kept the booty for himself. When right. David battled the Amalekite raiding party and took booty and the 400 fighting men who went with him wanted to not give any of the booty to the 200 fighting men uh, who had been too exhausted to go on the raid, David insisted that the booty belonged to oh, everybody yeah. because right. the victory had been the Lord's. Um, so so how talk to me about how the the these two men perceived the Lord's participation in their battles. I mean, clearly th Saul thought the Lord was participating in his battles. I mean, that's why he went to the witch Bindor, right? Yeah. I think that um, the, the big difference is focus where their eyes were. David's eyes were on God. He was always focused on God. And Saul's eyes were always focused on himself. And um, what he did, what he deserved, what his men did, what his men deserved, as opposed to this is what God did, and therefore we're going to do what God says. And that kind of links back to that first question about when the people would sing, Saul has killed his thousands and David his tens of thousands, right? There's a whole lot in Saul's response that is tied to his pride. Mm -hmm. And honestly, pride is insidious in human beings. It really is. There's something that we really are called to that entices us to step in between people and God and capture that glory for ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we have talked a lot about 
humility being taking ourselves out of that um, and self-effacing. Pride is the opposite side of that coin. So um, anytime that you find yourself in a situation um, where, where you are experiencing one of or the other, pride or humility, recognize that um, that's how to flip the switch. You know, you can, you can flip it back um, by, by remembering um, to, to efface yourself, to make it not about you. And I guess Saul made, always made it about him, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that was one of the things that, that we talked about was that um, it seemed like, you know, when you look even at some of the battles scene, you know, before the battle situations where, where Saul had his own personal timetable um, as to, you know, God was supposed to answer when he, when he asked and he was supposed to get an answer like right now. And if like when Samuel said, wait for, you know, however many days and then I'll come to you and Saul got impatient and went ahead and offered sacrifices on his own um, and, and, you know, was constantly sort of knowing better than God or Samuel in the situations where David would always wait and, and go to the priests and ask God and, and, and wait. <laughs> And one thing about pride is it's insatiable. Once you go down that um, that road, it's very difficult to discern what's your will and what's the will of God. So like Gail said, checking it with humility, very important. Absolutely. So when Saul knew he was facing certain death at the hands of the Philistines, he went to the Lord for guidance and reassurance, but the Lord was silent. Mm -hmm. Saul's response was one, to consult the witch of Endor, and two, to commit suicide. Mm -hmm. Repeatedly, when David is faced with death at the hands of Saul or his other enemies, David goes to the Lord for guidance and reassurance. And the Lord thus far has not been silent with him. And I pointed you to Psalm 13, which was a Psalm David wrote when he was in a desperate situation and felt like the Lord was not answering him because the Lord did not always answer David either. And I wanted you to know that. Um, so, so Psalm 13 was one of those times. What, what was the difference in the hearts of the two men in response to the Lord's silence? Uh, yeah, I was a little confused now confused on this on number two, but number one, uh, again, clearly, clearly Saul disregarded uh, God's commands on consulting the dead. Um, so cl clearly a, a bad thing. Number two, you know, I, I was wondering about that because Saul was defeated and wounded and uh i would have thought in that day that what he did may have been appropriate yep so the question there and and it again i don't want to judge saul um i'm just uh, because it, it may well have been appropriate in that day. He was mortally wounded anyway. They were going to torture him. You know, he fell on his sword. So I don't want to judge Saul. I just want to contrast okay. the re responses of the two men yeah. when they're pressed to an extremity. Gotcha. One of the things that came up on our group, uh, Gail, was that, and I, I think um, Marlene brought it up, when we go to Psalm 13, there's, you know, there's six verses to that Psalm. And the first word in verse five of Psalm 13 is, but, you know, and you've often heard, and you, and you brought up often, you know, the, the phrase, but God, you know, but God, but God, but God. Um, and, and then we also talked about how it's a pattern. Marlene, why don't you bring up what you said earlier? Cause I, I like the way you put that. Yeah. Um, you know, when you read through the Psalms, you see over and over and over again, 
the Psalms where he is, you know, feeling beset upon, feeling like God isn't listening, you know, he's in a, a situation where he's crying out, you know, God, why have you forsaken me? You know, I'm crying out to you. My bones are dust and, and on and on. But before the Psalm is over, you get that little, at the end, that little tag of, but God is good and I will trust to God and I will praise God and the people will praise God. There's always this reminding himself and the people that God is always good. And even if we don't hear what we want in this moment, we have to trust that God is good. And we praise God even when we are still not getting an answer. I love that. There's a song, you know, I think of everything by music. Um, music is my passion and, and songs speak to me. And I love spiritual songs and songs that are based on Bible passages and stuff like that. But there's a song and it's been out a few years now. When you can't see, when you can't trace his hand, trust his heart. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what David did. Even when David couldn't see God's hand moving, he knew God loved him and was going to move. So even though he couldn't see it, he trusted. Yeah. And um, that's, again, where their focus was. Saul's focus was on himself. Woe is me. This is horrible. I guess I'll die. Mm -hmm. As opposed to God is good. I'm in a bad spot. If God wants me out of here. He can get me out of here. I'm going to trust in him. You know, yeah. that has application from today, doesn't it? As much as it does back then. Yeah, exactly. Uh, clearly. Yeah. It really does. And it's not a passive sort of trusting in God, is it? You could never describe David as being passive, right? No. Not no, it's, 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 it's in those moments where I think he shows the, the commitment and the, and the, the effort and the energy that it takes to keep going back to, but I will trust in God. Um, because the easy way was for Saul, well, if God's not going to talk to me, I'm going to go talk to the witch, even though I've banished all the witches. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and well, if Samuel's not here yet, I'm going to go ahead and do the I'll sacrifice myself. Yeah. And, and, um, and the difference is that David, even when he cannot see, you know, like, like Shirley said, even when he cannot see the hand of God working in that moment, there is that 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 work of trust mm -hmm. that that I'm I'm gonna hang in there because God has always proved faithful. God will prove faithful again. And I as hard as it is, I'm going to wait to hear. And I want to bring know, out a principle here at the end that we're gonna really need in the next in about two lessons from now. And that is that this is not only about trust in this moment, but that these two concepts of humility and trust are two important legs of the stool. Um, this is, they are foundational to being able to navigate life with God. And um, the reason I say that is because the trust that David has requires the incredible courage to say to the Lord, to know in his heart, to know in our heart that I trust the Lord even if I die. Mm -hmm. That the Lord is more important than me. That I have li my life as I perceive it in this body is just the barest, tiniest part shadow beginning yeah. of what, of who I actually am and what my life actually is and what my life actually means. This kernel of life, the seed of life that we're living right now is hugely important, but it is seed. It is not the life, you know, that we are promised in God. It is just the beginning of it. 
and we will be transformed in ways we cannot imagine. We will have life in a fullness that we cannot conceive of right now. And that's, the tr that's what we're trusting God for. It is getting to that place that we understand that the bulk of our life is hidden in Christ. Mm -hmm. That's good. Mm -hmm. And that I what's happening to us that. right now in this moment no, is completely irrelevant to that. That we will gladly lay down our pride, our life, whatever, our possessions, our family, any of it. Because we're not focused on that kernel. Now, I'm not saying the kernel is not important. That kernel, where we are right now, the things we do matter. The things we do make a difference to us and to the whole world and to the entire spiritual world, I think. It's, it matters that we cling to the Lord, but it also matters that we know it is all about the Lord and it mm -hmm. is all the Lord's doing, right? We had a teaching earlier this week about the, the term in Christ. And we've, I didn't know this, but it occurs over 160 times in the word. And the whole conversation was what it was about what is our identity? If our identity, if we understand fully, which I don't, this side of heaven, but if we understand somewhat fully what it means to be in Christ, then it literally transforms the way we see ourselves, the way we deal with other people, the way we carry ourselves, the way we communicate, the way we make good on our problem, you know, all of that. Our need has... to make judgments or not. Thank you. Yes. But, you know, my whole identity, if it's formed in Christ as it should be, then the person I become is, is approximating more and more who I will become after we get past that kernel that you were talking about. That, that, that bigger person of who I will be for all eternity begins with how I see myself in Christ. Now, let, let, me, let me just say something. Uh, some, something I see a major problem with Christians today. All right? People, uh, it's great, you know, they... They put their trust in salvation. They, you know, they accept the Lord as their Savior. And then they go up on uh, about their lives. It's like, it's like what they did was just an interlude to their life that they are currently living. They don't understand what it meant to do what they did to become a Christian. That's like glad you said that. Go ahead, Julian. Fire. Sorry. That's fire insurance. You know? <laughs> fire. Yes. Yes. You're not, not getting the full blessings of what your life can be. That's right. And it's also, it's, it's the counterfeit of what we're talking about here. What I was trying to convey was the reality of this kernel of life and how it is the beginning of this yeah. huge blessing and how what we do now, as Pat was saying, has tremendous implications for who we become in the kingdom of heaven, right? Mm -hmm. What we're doing now matters. I completely reject the idea that, that we're not saved. You know, God clearly all the way through the whole Hebrew Bible has been doing nothing but saving his people by whatever means possible, right? He's, he's like made a bazillion ways for them to get saved. And none of them so far have been named Jesus, just saying, okay? No, you know, Jesus was like a big ultimate piece of this, but God is about saving us. God is the one who resurrected Jesus. God saves us. And so that's like off the table, as far as I'm concerned, that is a done deal. What matters in our walk, I'm so glad you brought this up, Ross, is that we remain in God's presence. Mm -hmm. And we can choose not to, re not to participate with God. We can choose, like Ross says, to go do our own thing, whatever, but we have completely stunted our growth in the kingdom of heaven, haven't we? We're, we're not learning anything. We're not developing new skills. I don't think when we die that all of a sudden, poof, 
you know, we meet the, the magic tooth fairy and she poofs us into great skills and a perfect person. That's not how this works. We are right now building these skills and the depth and the love of God that we will carry with us for our whole eternal lives. We will keep learning. We will keep, it's not, this is not magic. What we are being offered here is a gift to unwrap now. Mm -hmm. That's good. Isn't it? That's good. Well, Gail, I'll tell you, I'm, I, I needed to hear this because I am personally struggling. My husband tells me it's not me if I don't do this, but I worry about worrying because I'm worrying a lot because I have some challenges, but overall, my life is good and I'm so happy with my life that I worry that something might change. And, he, and he's like, you're worrying that you're worrying? You, you need to stop that. <laughs> <laughs> and so- Easier said than done, right, Julia? Yeah. <laughs> it is. When you're happy, you wanna keep being happy. You know, when you're not happy, you want to become happy. Hello. Yeah, Hello. But you know what? I know you, Julia. And, and I know that internal to you is a core of happiness that exists in whatever situation you're in. Thank Your you. ship may, may wobble here and there. It may waver. You may dash up against a rock here and there. But I have seen your ship come right back to center. Oh, thank you. Good word. My ship gets stuck in a canal sometimes. Yes, it does. <laughs> Is it the size of the Empire State Building? <laughs> Y'all are too funny. I think that we're done for today. Yeah, uh, we're talking about ships. Laugh. Yeah. But, but we were see you next week um and i hope that you have a wonderful week uh, looking forward as you're opening this gift and continuing to lay yourself down pour yourself out before the lord amen amen, amen. amen. thank you guys it was thank good you. thank you bye bye everybody bye, bye. bye.